Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this batch video of one shots taken from the HFY subreddit. The links to the originals will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do so, please consider subscribing, because for those that don't, you will be visited later on by a biomass eating cloud of sentient nanites. Story number one. Poker Face. Written by Algy Father Anthracite. So, there are 52 cards split into 4 suites. Each suite contains a card that is numbered 2 through 10, and 3 face cards, Jack, Queen, and King. Each suite has a card called an Ace, in which can be placed on a low or a high, depending on the hand in the game. Got it? Dresgul looked into the face of his human compatriot. So far, I understand. Please continue. Okay. So, the most basic game that you can play is blackjack. In that game, you are dealt two cards. One up, one down. Up means everyone can see it. Down means only you can look at it. Incidentally, no peak means that no one can look at your card. So once you have your two cards, and the other players have theirs, you look to see how close you are to the total of a score of 21 points. Face cards are worth 10 points. Number cards are worth their number. And aces are worth 1 or 11, depending on your hand. If you get a face card and an ace is on deal, it's called blackjack and you win automatically. If you don't get blackjack, you want to get as close to 21 as you can without going over. Going over is a bust and then you lose automatically. If your number is closer to 21 than your opponent, you win. If their number is closer to 21, they win. Dreskor was flipping over random cards from the deck and looking at the pup marks on the cards and the faces drawn on them. This seems to be the most robust form of entertainment. The mathematical formulas involved are most exciting. I think these poker cards would go over quite well with my colleagues back on Gildar. Is it a very expensive game set? Oh no, you can get a deck of cards for a couple of bucks. Here, keep this set. I have four or five. Chris put a fresh deck still in its slip cover on the table and slid it across the green felt to his blobby alien friend. You can get nicer decks. They do cost more, but these ones are the ones that most people use. I know they make plastic ones that are waterproof, and some have fancy custom art. I got a buddy from college who collects them. He likes the artwork on them. He told me that playing cards date back to ancient China, and were originally painted on some sort of leaf from the Emperor's Garden. Playing cards have existed on Earth for hundreds of years. Maybe a thousand at this point. I'm not sure. Most intriguing. As a mathematician, I am interested in the number of suites and cards. Why were these numbers selected? Dreskor was using several pseudopods to hold several cards up at once. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, Dres. I have a few thoughts on this subject as a mathematician myself. I don't know for sure, mind you, but I always thought that it had something to do with the rotation of the Earth around the Sun, Chris said as he gathered the cards from the open deck. He began to shuffle and bridge the cards, then absentmindedly dealt our two hands of five cards as he spoke. Earth has four seasons, hence the four suites. We have 13 lunar cycles per year, so 13 cards per suite and we have 52 weeks in a year, so a total of 52 cards. My old college buddy told me that cards were used for fortune-telling way back in history, and astrology, which was the study of stars as cosmic influences that was popular throughout mankind's early history. It's actually the forerunner to astronomy, which, as you know, is a real science, at least here on Earth. After Chris had dealt out the cards, he set the deck aside and picked up his hand, and arranged the cards in ascending order from left to right. As he finished, he lay the cards face up on the table, and spread them out in a neat line. So, we have about an hour to get you familiar with the rules of poker, before the other guys get you. So let me explain the rules and we can play a bunch of practice hands. Dresgul enjoyed the early rounds of the game, as Chris's friends were all very friendly and jovial. They had brought an earth beverage called beer, which Dresgul really enjoyed. The ethanol was similar to several natural substances on his planet, but did not affect him as it did his human counterparts. He also enjoyed the heavy botanical taste of the hops used to flavor the beverage. After several hours of playing the game, Dresgul had gotten a firm grip on the mechanics of play. 
They were playing a game called five card draw, in which sets of cards had fixed point values, and cards could be traded out to try and make the best hand possible. He was able to use his skills as a mathematician to roughly figure out the odds of particular hands, and bet accordingly. Jonesy, one of Chris's friends, had gone through all his chips and had to rebuy to get more chips to bet with. Dreskel was, much to his own concern, starting to lose chips very quickly, and would soon have to rebuy himself. So, said Dreskel, as Michael, another of Chris's friends, began to deal the next hand. I know Chris is a mathematician. What do all of you do for a living? I'm a sales rep for a construction firm, said Michael. I own a catering business, Josie said. I work in the college's fine art department, said Bill. I see. Have you all been playing poker long? Dreskel asked as he gathered his hand and sorted his cards, in the fashion that Chris had taught him. I really only got into it when I was in college, as a student, said Bill. High school for me. One of my buddies ran a game in a garage every other weekend, said Michael. I only started playing a couple years ago. I couldn't afford it until then, said Jonesy. Most interesting. May I have two, please? Dreskel flicked two cards into the discard pile. The following Monday, Chris was walking next to Dreskel on their way to lunch at the faculty lounge. Chris, may I ask a question regarding last week's poker game? Sure thing, Dres, what's up? How was it that I lost to you and Michael during the poker game? I made conservative bets, and only when I was relatively sure that I had the best odds to win. And yet, I lost. Did I misunderstand a rule or something of that nature? Chris laughed a little as he heard his friend explain his reasoning. No, Drez, you played perfectly. They got into the line for the cafeteria. Chris handed Dreskel a tray and placed his own on the edge of the counter. Did you see how Jonesy kept throwing an arm over the back of his chair and slouching a little? He was trying to look relaxed, but he was really nervous. He had a good hand and was trying to keep it from looking too excited so everyone else would bet. It's called a bluff. Bluff? Dresgol placed a cube of gelatin on his tray. It's trying to raise the amount of money in the pot without letting on that you think that you have an advantage. There are other kinds as well, like trying to buy the pot, which is where you put on a big bet to try and force the others to fold. I think I misunderstood the game of poker, said Dreskel. How's that, bud? asked Chris, getting a turkey sandwich. It's about psychology, not math, said Dreskel, grabbing a bottle of water for himself and Chris. The cards are cool, though, so I'll keep those. End of story number one. Story number two. Stop pooping our snots, or else. Written by Retro Inferno. This is starting to get ridiculous, hissed the Kanaka woman in the waiting audience recording her every word. Overall, she resembled a viper with four eyes and arms standing out over nine feet tall. Her scales were brown and yellow, which were patterned in such a way that they were vaguely reminiscent of a leopard. A crown perched on her head indicated that she was a high-ranking Kanaka aristocrat, more specifically a young princess but she was by no means immature since a carnivorous species could live for centuries. There has been many diplomatic incidents involving the humans, she continued. A so-called boop the snoop challenge has resulted in many humans attempting to touch a calica's sensitive snout with their fingers. Let us remind humans that we are fearsome predators and that attempting to do something like that could be a terrible mistake. After hissing out those words, the video began playing behind her. A human man in peacekeeping combat gear filmed himself from the first-person perspective while sneaking up on a Calica soldier. He raised his fingers before speaking, Hey there! Saying this resulted in the Calica turning around. Like a predator, he sprung forward and tried to poke her on the nose. Boop! Oop! Instead of the Calica grabbed his arm before his fingers could come into contact with her snout, and she gave him a death stare. Four eyes stares deep into the camera. Afterward, she started calling around him and restraining him with all fours. Wait, it was just a prank. I can't help myself. I must poop snoots. Squeezing him between her coils aroused a scream as he squirmed. Then she hissed in return. As the video ended, the cameras focused back on the Calica princess and her hissing filled the air. 
In the name of public safety, I am officially issuing a decree that will make pooping snoots illegal within my dominion. Any humans found attempting to touch the nose of any Kalika or Menakai citizens will be punished with fines. Furthermore, there will be severe repercussions for repeat offenders. With that, she started slithering away from the podium. Journalists asked a flurry of questions that she ignored and drones hovering in the air snapped countless photos. Eventually, she reached a more private part of their palace, where a set of heavy doors slammed shut, leaving behind all the rabble as her bodyguards accompanied her. These guards were all Kalakai women, of course. This was because the men of their matriarchal species were only half the size of the females, and physically weaker on top of that. Soon, she was slithering down a hallway, while the red sun illuminated the way forward thanks to the glass ceiling. It was just a glimpse at the arid climate encompassing this part of the planet. As this occurred, the princess thought about the volatile political situation. There were talks of succeeding with the Interstellar Federation, which was part of the reason why federal peacekeepers were not allowed to set foot or tail within the confinements of a palace. She hoped that a relaxing bath and perhaps a bit of sunbathing to warm up her cold-blooded scales would put her mind at ease so that she could think clearly. What caught her attention was the sound of the firstborn son hissing and snickering. Do it again, he hissed. This was followed by a feminine voice, a human one, which her translator turned into a single comprehensible yet infuriating word. Boop! Once again, her son did the equivalent of laughing, albeit it was far more ecstatic. As for the princess, she narrowed her eyes and held out a single arm, which made the bodyguard stop slithering. Stay here, she commanded. As a result, the bodyguards, with their plasma weapons drawn, took positions along the hallway. With that out of the way, the princess nodded and opened the door to her son's room. She was met by the sight of a new human maid playing with a young son when she was supposed to be assisting with the cleaning drones. Again! Again! said her son with absolute glee. Okay, just one more time, replied the human as she smiled. She held up a single finger and gently pressed it against his snoot. Boop! The typical sound of laughter abruptly halted upon the Calica boy seeing the princess, who was staring at the two with death in her four green eyes. Blue blood flushed to his face, giving the light green scales a new hue. Oh, hey mom! Those words resulted in the maid turning her head and locking eyes with the princess. Her jaw went agape, and a look of absolute shock and terror temporarily overwhelmed the human before she mustered up the courage to speak. Ah, Madame Cadreau, I was just, uh... She was cut off by the calico boy. I ordered her to play with me rather than cleaning, so please don't punish her for my transgressions. He looked at his mother with puppy dog eyes as she crossed her arms and slithered towards the two. Eventually, the maid realized that Cadreau was approaching her, so she slowly backed away. This didn't stop the princess from gradually towering over her until the human was backed up against the wall. Then suddenly, the calica lowered her head so that they were face to face. Meanwhile, the boy weakly hissed and grabbed his mother's tail. It was my fault! Please, don't do anything to her! Ignoring this, Kadru hissed the words that sent shivers down the human's spine. Do it. D uh, do, d do what? muttered the maid in return. Boop me! Excuse me, madame? The princess slightly opened her mouth, revealing the venomous fangs. With my authority as the princess of my dominion, I order you to boop my snoot. A look of confusion spread across the human's face as she scrunched it up. Um, okay. With a hand lightly shaking, she raised her finger and momentarily touched Kadru's snout. Boop! For Kudru, the gentle touch of her fingertip reminded her of a soft yet warm kiss. This was thanks to the body heat temporarily searching from the human's bare skin into her chilly scales. Overall, the experience made her think of the deceased husband, who she missed very much. So that's what all the fuss is about, she hissed. Do it once more, I command it. Again, the maid's finger came into contact with her nose. But this time, the calica held it in place with two arms of her forearms. Then the human's entire hand spread across her snout. As a result, the princess sat there for a few long moments, experiencing nothing but the absolute euphoria from the human's body heat. She relived the memory of spending time with her husband before his demise. 
more specifically, when they basked underneath the sun with their bodies curled together during the intense moment of intimacy. In the meantime, the maid sat there with an awkward silence, but not knowing what the hell was going on. Eventually, Kadru released the human's hand and returned towering over her. Thank you, she hissed. You are dismissed. Continue your cleaning duties. Right, right, right away, madame. With that, she departed the scene and started cleaning in a very frantic fashion. In the aftermath, the princess coiled around her son, doing the equivalent of hugging him. She admired how the boy strongly took after his father with his green scales, much like the rest of her many sons, but also a reminder that her husband had made the ultimate sacrifice, so that others could be brought into this world. Although the child returned the favor by hugging her in return, he overall seemed dumbfounded by whatever just happened and cocked his head to the side. What was that about, Mom? I just wanted to see what I was missing out on as all. She answered with a wry grin. It was enough to make me change my mind about something. Maybe I should allow that sort of thing, but only if both parties consent. It's a very intimate thing to do, after all. You little pervert. End of story number two. I hope that you enjoyed. If you'd like to support the channel or the author, all the stuff is down below. And as always, I hope that you guys have a good one, and I'll see you in the next story. Cheers.